Rev One Nation, what is going on? Welcome to another Wednesday live stream. This is your host, TK Coleman. It's good to see you all out there. I hope you're, the middle of your week finds you in a, in a good place and in a healthy space. Um, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, just to remind you, we are here live every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have TK's Two Cents, that's where I take a couple of tweets from the week and I give a couple of thoughts on each tweet to provide you with some context behind the ideas or some tips on how to apply those ideas pragmatically into your life. And then on Wednesdays, Kamau and I are here for the Revolution Will Be live stream, and that's where we bring on a special guest to talk about different ideas that can help you be more innovative and permissionless in your everyday life. I'm really excited about today's show. So I have in my hand, a very excellent book that was sent to me by the guest today. It's called The Black Male Equity Initiative Anthology, Reclaiming the Dream. This was curated by the one and only Dr. Pamela Jolly. And one of the contributors here is Sean Dove. And Sean Dove is the founder and CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And this is an initiative that's dedicated to promoting the ownership mindset, promoting equity, the wealth mindset, the value creation mindset, among black males. And today I wanna to talk with Sean Dove about his story, what inspires him, uh, what keeps him fueled during challenging times and how we can cultivate the success mindset in black communities and why that matters, why that's more important now than ever before. But before we get started, I wanna play a clip from a TED talk that Sean Dove did that was I found particularly moving and uh, I want you to hear this, um, and this will be kind of like the, the setup for our conversation today. So I'm going to play a clip from his TED Talk called Stop Stalling on Your Calling. My name is uh, Sean Dove, and I want you to know that I grew up my formative years on 119th Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. It may not be in my bio, but I have a degree from UCLA, a PhD from UCLA, and that's the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue. 
And on that corner, we would play games like hot peas and butter. We would play games like freeze tag, deep memories of my youth. But there was also on the side, and it was mostly girls, but not all girls, but they were doing double dutch, right? And y'all know how double dutch goes, they're doing double dutch. And every once in a while, I would be like that little boy, the boy st standing by, and I would come up and I would act like I was gonna jump in. I would act like I was gonna jump in, and this would be the time that I was gonna jump in, because I really felt like I was called to double dutch, and I would go through the motion, go through the motion, but I kept going through the motion, and I never jumped in. I was stalling on my calling, and I just wouldn't jump in. And I'm here to ask everyone, are you stalling on your calling and you won't jump in? I just want to... Sean Dove, thank you for not stalling on your calling. Thank you for inspiring so many other people to respect the calling upon their lives. And thank you for joining Kamau and I on this live stream today. Welcome to the Rev One, Brother Sean. Great to be here in the Rev One. I can check this off my bucket list, you know, all year. I'll be waiting for, you know, when I'm going to go to Rev One, when PK going to invite me to the Rev One. And so uh, I'm thrilled to be here with uh, you and Kamal. And um, you know that I love you. And, you know, as I've been sharing, anytime I'm engaged with you, uh, it has been an enhancing, elevating uh, uh, experience. And, uh, I said, how do I prepare for TK? And I was like, there's no preparation, right? Because <laughs> you've been posting stuff and tweeting stuff and saying stuff directly to me that I've been wondering, this brother has access to my journal. He's been reading my journal and <laughs> has been issues and the questions and uh, the things that have been driving me and growing me. And uh, so I just, just happy to be here, man. Oh, man. It's so Great. good to have you, brother. Well, well, you brought up your journal. Let's talk about the journey. Um, you, you mentioned that pivotal moment where you realized that you were stalling on your calling and that began to change things for you. I love to hear more about your backstory. A lot of people know who you are. You've, you've been around the country, around the world, collaborating with some of the most powerful, influential people in America. Um, you've been on the Steve Harvey show. Um, everybody knows who Mr. Dove is. But but I want to know the the story behind the leader that so many people are looking to for guidance and inspiration. What what was that moment for you that made you not only just be willing to kind of jump in, but what was the moment that made you like say, hey, I think I, I think I need to lead, and I think I can do this. Great question, and I don't think that it was uh, just one moment. Uh, I think it was accumulation and curation of a series of uh, moments along my uh, a lifetime. And uh, I would say the most important moment is the uh, present moment and the role that I have uh, being Nehemiah, Cameron, and Caleb's dad. Uh, sometimes, you know, my prayer is forgive them, Lord. They know not that they dance on my ass nerve. And, uh, you know, uh, I, and being the, uh, husband of uh, my divine mate for 26 years, uh, uh, Desiree, right. And, uh, she reminds me all the time that black male achievement begins and ends, uh, uh at home. And, uh, so, uh, that is the most important leadership job. And like in every day, there's something new, right? I haven't been a husband and a father on uh, September 9th, uh, 2020 before. So, so this is, uh, uh, this is new. And as far as my background, you know, I'm a native New Yorker, lived in every borough except for Staten Island, uh, born to uh, an amazing uh, Jamaican mom, Deanna, uh, a single mom. And, um, he just uh, instilled in me a spirit of uh, sacrifice, uh, a spirit of uh, entrepreneurship and creativity. And one of the things that 
my mother did was, um, you know, she was a single mom and she relied, she used uh, this thing called social capital in the community. And so in my formative years, I stayed and lived with my godmother, uh, Lillian Smith on 119th Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem uh, during the week. And on the weekends, I lived with my mother. And uh, Lillian Smith, we called her Lil, classic, uh, matriarch, big mama. She ran numbers with Nikki Barnes's uh, uh, father, Roy Barnes. And if you ever saw the movie uh, Lackawanna Blues with Hill Harper, that was my experience. There was uh, boarders in the house. Uh, Mr. Archie was uh, a boarder. He was a Bajan. And every day, no matter what the number was, he was like, 371? I was going to play that number. And so as I described in the TED Talk, uh, there was this real sense of a community, uh, the University of the Corner of Lenox uh, Avenue. And uh, growing up in Harlem um, in the 60s and the uh, early 70s, yes, there was drugs. Yes, there was violence. Uh, mm -hmm. But there was a real sense of um, extended family and community. And I think that that poured into me. Uh, at fifth grade, my mother and I, we moved down to the Upper West Side. Um, and I was what you call a latchkey kid. My mother was working and, uh, you know, at five years, you know, at fifth grade, you know, 11 years old, I had the key. I was, you know, on my own and, um, got involved in the youth program called the Dome, uh, project and, uh, my basketball career. And so I think the thread has been this whole sense of, uh, uh community, right? And, um, I have been blessed to uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, dance on both sides of the street. I thought that I was uh, wanted to sell loose joints on the corner of uh, Lenny, um, Amsterdam and uh, 80th Street. I know you don't know anything. You'll come out and know anything about loose joints. Uh, there might be a few old heads in the, uh, the listening audience, the audience that do. But uh, I didn't have to do that. But uh, that's what all my friends were doing. And I uh, found out about this youth program called the Dome Project. And uh, it was there where I uh, joined the basketball team. Uh, the founder and mentor, a guy named John Simon, before we got on the basketball court as a team, we would have to sit in a circle and read. And uh, one of the first books that we read was uh, Claude Brown's uh, Man Child in the Promised Land. And he infused, uh, um, you know, our thirst basketball with uh, literacy. And when we left the community center and went on a corner and we were smoking joints and uh, 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 drinking 40s, uh, we were talking about uh, the character Sonny in, the, uh, in Claude Brown, right? And those were seeds all along, right? And I just had so many um, uh, coaches, uh, uh, my mother, my uh, grandparents on, uh, on both sides that believed in me uh, before I even believed in myself. And uh, I think so much of what I do and how I lead my life is about reciprocity. You know, I tell mm -hmm. this story in the TED Talk, but life is a boomerang. Whatever you put out there comes back to you. And so uh, I live my life uh, trying to boomerang back uh, TK so much of uh, what has been given to me. And when we think about black male achievement and the field and movement of black male achievement, um, you know, I think of love, safety, and belonging. We all want that, right? Um, I think of our tagline to love, learn, and lead. And so the all the examples that I had, men and women uh, of leadership uh, showed me uh, what I wanted to be. And there were examples of what I didn't want to be, right? Uh, very easily could have uh, uh, gone the other way, did stuff over my life, and just didn't get uh, did caught. Didn't, didn't get caught. But I'm going to stop there. I feel like I'm a... Uh, uh, you know, I'm a creative rambler and um, I can keep going, right? You can just ask them first, you know, a, a, a question and, and, and I can keep going. It's really important. 
uh, to say, and while uh, the founder and uh, CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, uh, this work is not new work, right? This is 400 years of uh, liberation uh, work. This is uh, 400 years of organizing and uh, 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 fighting oppression. And uh, one of my mission mantras is that, you know, God gave us two hands for a reason, uh, one to build with and battle with, right? And so this is 400 years of building and battling. I think that I uh, uh, get uh, undue credit for building and creating this movement of black male achievement. And I just stand on the uh, uh, shoulders of so many men and women, right? This power of being in the right place at the right time with the right people and the uh, 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 right uh, vision. And I'll just close this opening monologue by saying, um, you know, this is September, uh, on September 25th, uh, I will be uh, 58 years old. And when I was that kid uh, on the corner of uh, 119th Street and Lenox Avenue, uh, I thought at 58 years old, uh, I'd be shopping for my rocking chair. I'd be uh, looking uh, for where I'm going to settle down. And uh, at 58, knocking on the door at 58, I feel like I'm just uh, uh, getting started, right? And so all that I've done and the, all that you've mentioned was all preparation for this moment, right? And uh, I, I truly believe, like yourself, uh, like Kamal, and, and whoever's watching, that we were all born uh and, and, and anointed for this appointed time that we're in. Brother, these are the best kinds of conversations when all you got to do is ask one question and get that many gems in a single answer. So I was going to go in a different direction, but you mentioned how back in the day you thought when you would you would turn 41, you'd be buying your rocking chair, you, you'd be probably, you know, father time would be knocking on the door this reminds me of something that you said. You, 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 I heard you suggest to people that they should write their own eulogies before they die. I, I would love to hear you talk more about why you think that's so important. Wow. Yeah. So I um, was introduced to this concept um, through a session with a number of years ago with an executive coach. Right. And what I share with um, I'm blessed to be able to help build community of leaders. And and I share with uh, the leaders, if you don't have a therapist uh, or mentor um, and an executive, all three, an executive coach. And I was in a session with an executive coach and uh, he said, you know, write your eulogy uh, uh, down. Right. And I was like, wow, what is that? Right. Uh, why, why would I do that? And he says, it allows you to put stuff into perspective. And uh, I wrote uh, my eulogy. And the most important things in the eulogy was not necessarily about me being the CEO of the campaign uh, for Black Male Achievement. It wasn't about all the, uh, the things that I did in the deed. It was the relationships of... Uh, my, with my family, my children, my wife, uh, my mother, and my friendships. And it helped me to uh, put things uh, into perspective. But it also, uh, I'm a strong believer in, um, you know, he who writes uh, history owns it, right? And we're talking about ownership, right? And why wait mm -hmm. for someone to, uh, and it's, wow, the timeliness of this question, because yesterday I was, uh, I attended, my wife's aunt's funeral. She was 80 years old uh, when she passed away on September 1st. And just hearing the countless stories of generations of her, her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren coming up and talking about not necessarily what she did, but how she made them feel. And so I am a firm believer of keeping a journal and I think that this is an exercise that leaders should do uh, on a periodic basis, right? And my wife knows, right? Uh, you don't have to uh, figure out, well, you know, she's going to write and contribute what she wants to uh, contribute, but that my life uh, have, has left 
uh, in a way, a literary uh, legacy of this is what goes into uh, my journal. Uh, she has a list of uh, my playlists, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the celebration of uh, a life, right? Uh, TK, I remember uh, a number of years ago seeing a sign, uh, a billboard that talked about um, investing in a dignified uh, funeral, right? And, uh, you know, making sure that you had burial insurance and it, it was it was an ad. And I said, wow, you know, what about investing in a uh, dignified life, right? And so that's what I do and how I uh, strive. And I will say that when I talk about my story and when I mentor, and when I coach, uh, it's very important for me to uh, lift up not all of uh, the great things and successes, but uh, many of the stumbles and the mistakes uh, along the way. And you, and I want you to uh, share a little bit about this, you know, you experienced um, Rumble Young Man Rumble uh, last year, which uh, was the convening of uh, uh, intergenerational men and women in the movement for black male achievement. And uh, Muhammad Ali uh, was my first hero and uh, people uh, are quick to lift up the iconic image of Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston in their uh, second fight when he knocked him out in the first round. It is like a victorious picture, you know, the, 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 the big bear is uh, on the canvas. And I love that picture, it's on my wall behind me. Uh, but the most iconic picture for me of Muhammad Ali is the picture of uh, in March 1971 in his first fight with Joe Frazier. And it was the 15th round, Ali, who uh, stood up for uh, his beliefs and uh, refused to uh, enter the uh, Vietnam War. His title was stripped. And this was his third fight after three years in exile, could not make a living in what his God-given ability uh, was. And he had, he had it was the 15th round and Joe Frazier hit Muhammad Ali with the left hook that uh, 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 my friend David Banks, who leads uh, the Eagle Academy, says that Ali's ancestors felt that left hook uh, in, in, in Africa. But Ali got up. The image of Ali on the ground, he had every excuse to say, look, I can stay down. My iconic image of uh, Ali is being able to bounce back up. And he lost that fight, but he went on to uh, win uh, two other fights against uh, Joe, uh, Joe Frazier. And uh, when I think of Ali's career, I think of us as leaders, we need rivals, right? We, 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 we need um, giants uh, to fight and, 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 and issues to 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 conquer right and so uh i will say that my prayer is that when someone is hearing my eulogy right they're sitting there and uh you know sade gil scott heron uh 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 stevie wonder you know is on kirk franklin's on the soundtrack uh but when they hear my eulogy my prayer is that there is someone that hears it, that is on the, that that might be on the edge of giving up. And they hear my eulogy and my eulogy becomes their epilogue. That moment where they say, I'm not gonna, there is more to uh, uh, my story. And uh, that's my prayer. And that's why I ask uh, folks to write their, uh, their eulogy. It if, if I could jump in real quick, I um, I have to admit, I, I've been a part of quite a few of these conversations by now. And, and one of the things that I really admire about you, Sean, is is the passion that you speak with. You can feel it. It's, it's I think, a lot of conversations I've been in, um, especially if we're talking to, you know, a bigger, a bigger name guest, there's a little nervousness um, in my stomach that I might feel, some tightness. But on this conversation, it, it's kind of like it's it's warmth and it's 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 like fire and it it's excitement. It's like because like your passion like comes through 
in almost every word that comes out of your mouth. You could just feel it. it the passion um, really is ju just kind of just resonates from 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 the way that you talk about things. But you know, one of the things that you mentioned that I was really fascinated, and that prior to you saying something, and prior to me kind of uh, being a part of this entrepreneurial praxis community where I met TK. TK introduced me to this concept of social capital and never had I heard that in school, never even in college, um, the time that I was there, I, it was never talked about it. And I, I, I didn't really understand what is it, what's the value of it. And so and until I met TK, actually, and, and, and I thought he was the person who coined this term. He had this whole philosophy on why it's valuable and how you should respect it and how to cultivate it and um, you know, where, it, where, where, it, where is its place in the grand scheme of capital? You know, you, you talk about having um, equity, you talk about having um, various different types of capital, working capital, human capital. So, you know, you talked about the, the importance of that in, in the neighborhood. And I kind of just want, you know, to, to put you on the spot, Sean, to see if you can shine some light on what is social capital, how can it be leveraged, um, and then how can it be cultivated? Well, great, great question. And um, I think that uh, social uh, capital has existence, existence, uh, existed since the dawn of time, right? And um, it's about relationships. It's about connection. Uh, it's about uh, adding value to others and not seeking what can others do for for you. Um, I think at the heart of our existence, uh, no matter race or gender, um, we want connection. And we need connection and we need a sense of belonging. And to me, social capital is really about community. Right. And when I think of the campaign for black male achievement and black folks, black folks are relational. Right. We are mm -hmm. relational uh, people. And, um, you know, I learned uh, a classic example of social capital um, through my poetry teacher uh, in high school. My first three years of high school, I went to a school called Brooklyn Tech um, in New York City. I thought I wanted to be an architect. Right. And I got into a technical drawing class and I was like, whoa, this is not for me. I was comparing my drawing to uh, my classmates drawing. Now, I don't know if we got time. We can talk about comparisons. In my last two years, uh, I went to uh, got a scholarship to this prep school. And um, when I was looking for colleges, uh, the guidance uh, counselors, right, they gave me this list of, uh, of schools to apply to. Uh, but my mentors, like, throw that list away. You need to raise the bar. But my poetry teacher, Mrs. Carlson, said, have you ever heard of this school called uh, Wesleyan? And I was like, no, I never heard of that school. And she shared that, uh, well, my father taught there, and I know the admissions uh, a director there. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I went to minority pre-freshman weekend, or maybe I missed that and went after uh, minority pre-freshman weekend. But I found myself interviewing directly with the uh, director of admissions, right? And that was an example of social capital. My mother, when she found Lel, right, she needed childcare, right? And she heard through the grapevine that there was this woman uh, that took care of other uh, children uh, along with her granddaughter. And so social capital is one of several capitals that uh, it doesn't, we all have it, right? You know, financial capital, we gotta go out and seek, but uh, social capital, like right now, we're in each other's uh, 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 network. And I think that you can go to the number one college or whatever the US News and World Reports you know, list is, and you can go to the 300th uh, school on that list. But when you show up, and I'm talking like, you know, who's showing up, well, there's still some folks showing up on campus, but it's the relationships that you cultivate outside of the classroom. And so you can go to that top school 
and don't cultivate relationships, but then go to that 300th ranked school, but be involved in sports, be involved in arts and culture, extracurricular uh, 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 activities, and build relationships and leverage those relationships once you uh, 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 graduate. And, you know, TK held up, I, what I love about the Zooms and these, uh, and, I, and I had this as a prop also, uh, this Black Male Equity uh, uh, Initiative and Dr. Pamela Jolly, um, she teaches that, you know, um, equity, we have to, as black folks, and particularly as black men in this instance, uh, we have to divine equity our way. If we compare and try and say we're going to close the racial wealth gap, uh, there is a 400 year head start, right? And so we have to create equity our own way, right? And we have to find it our own way. And it starts with our value of ourselves, our love for ourselves. Part of the, the, the year-long curriculum, we did a, uh, a DNA reveal and, and, and going back and discovering our roots in Africa. We partnered uh, with uh, AfricanAncestry.com uh, 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 um, and found out that my lineage is uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, the Mende tribe. And so our self-worth, right, and, and, and our value is, is, is first. So this cultural capital, this intellectual capital, uh, obviously this financial capital, but Kamal, thanks for uh, lifting up uh, um, the social capital. And uh, in this day and age, uh, it's about relationships and, um, you know, and yes, you know, who do you know? And uh, who can you call? Who knows you? Yeah, I, I, th I think that was one of the biggest lessons I think I got working firsthand with TK as he's building this Revolution of One project, that it's not just about transactional, approaching things transactionally. It's it's so much about the relationships that you build and the way that you cultivate them. And like you said, Sean, when you start out, a lot of times you don't even have the financial capital. You might not have all these other resources um, that your competitors have, but what you do have is the ability to cultivate social capital, is the ability to lead and be relational and to lead and create value for other people. And, you know, and, and, and to do the to do the 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 slogan for black male achievement to 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 love, to learn, to lead all of those things contribute to. Soul. And I think it, it's it's been really cool because this conversation we're having is a product of social capital. Of, of something that did not exist, you know, um, two years beforehand and, and through relationships and through uh, teaching and just kind of collaborating, uh, something beautiful was born. You know, what I love about that and, and, and some of this is about mindset, right? And some of us have a finite mindset, right? There's not mm -hmm. enough uh, for everybody. And uh, some of us have uh, uh, infinite um, my mindset. And I think the how I've l led my life, uh, how I've tried to with partners and folks that have helped build the campaign for Black Male Achievement, uh, it's a platform, right? And But it's not just a platform for me. The joy that I get is being able to lift up and build a platform for others to shine. Uh, and I think that TK is a personification uh, of that. When you think of the revolution uh, of one, right? And this is a platform, but here's a platform where, you know, you're able to shine, others are able to shine, we're sharing these messages. And uh, I think that, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I share this one of our other mission mantras for the campaign for Black Male Achievement is like, you know, there's no cavalry coming to save the day uh, in our communities, right? That, you know, we are the iconic leaders that we are, uh, are waiting for, right? And yes, you got to start with a revolution one, but there is safety and numbers. You know, I talk about, you know, back in the day, you know, there was a term that there was static you know, when I was growing up and, uh, you know, whether it's beef or, or whatever. And, and somebody said, you know, there's some static, you know, you know, we got some trouble. Uh, 
I was by myself, or I looked around and I was like, uh, who, who, who am well, this might not be a good day for a, a static, right? And well, I had Squeaky with me, and I had uh, a Day Sad Sack, and Pop, and I had the crew. We had this little graffiti group uh, called the Pearls, right? Some people might have said it was a gang, but it wasn't a gang. It was a group. But if I had the whole crew, I was like, okay, I'm down for static. And I think with the whole economic wealth building, I think that uh, for me, and when I look at uh, what needs to be done in this ongoing movement, uh, uh, not only for black male achievement, for black lives, how do we better work together, right? Um, and organize our resources, right? You know, and one of the uh, things about this mission mantra, right? The second half of it, you know, yes, the first half people requote all the time, you know, uh, there's no cavalry coming, right? We are the uh, iconic leaders that we've been waiting for. But after the semicolon of that quote is, we are the curators of the change we're seeking to see. And inherent in that part, right, uh, is that we already have everything that we need. God has told me, stop praying for new ideas, Sean. Work the stuff that I have already given you. You don't need another new idea. Curate everything that I've already given you. And some of that curation requires uh, resuscitation. What are some of the stuff that you tried before? Might have been ahead of its time might have, uh, and, and TK knows some of these things, I've been, you know, and, and I know that I won't be able to resuscitate this stuff by myself, right? Um, and so what is it that we as a community, what is it we as leaders need to curate that we are already, uh, uh, we, we already have? So uh, I don't know. You, you're on. Uh, you're on mute. You're, you're on mute. TK. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Thanks for catching that. So first of all, uh, thank you for expounding on that quote because I actually had a picture of that quote about um, about there's no Calvary coming, and I was going to have you comment on it, but you got to it. You got to it early, which is good. Um, I, I want to build on this theme, man, because one of the ideas that's very near and dear to my heart is this idea that it's possible to acknowledge difficulties and disadvantages without adopting a victim mindset. And I've spent a lot of time working in predominantly white spaces where when there's a conversation about black success, black progress, there's kind of a tendency to, to, to sort of associate that with black folks complaining at, from a state of not being able to do anything for ourselves. And the reality is in black communities, we're having conversations all the time about things like economic self-sufficiency, taking charge of our communities, not begging and pleading with people that disagree with us about what's going on in our communities, but building and collaborating. And I feel like you embody that mindset so well. I, I, I don't think I ever see you on on social media arguing with people who don't think black folks have problems i don't think i ever see you getting in debates with people who might see problems in black communities as an illusion i just see you building i see you mm -hmm. building relationships i see you building programs i see you building people building people's confidence and their potential and that's something that i aspire to i, I really look up to you for that and i think you do that phenomenally well that's the first thing i wanted to say to you now I want to quote you on words back. Yes, sir. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going back to this book here. Okay. And, and I want to quote something you said. You, you cited several principles um, about, about equity and ownership, but, but there are two here that I, that I want to quote and I want to have you go into. You said, one, we don't have a capital problem. We have a stewardship problem. Two, if income is our issue, then collaboration is our solution. What does that mean to say that we have a stewardship problem? You know, because I, mm. I I know there are a lot of people out there that's like, nah, Sean, I got a capital problem. You know, you give me some capital, I can immediately solve all my problems. 
What does that mean to say we have a stewardship problem? And, and how do we pivot that understanding into being able to collaborate with one another to find a way out or find a way up? Wow. So that's that's good. And um, I think those two quotes, uh, I was re-quoting uh, Dr. Pamela Jolly, uh, who I think you met at uh, Rumble. And um, what's interesting, you know, when I spun off from the Open Society Foundations, uh, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement uh, in 2015. And on my whiteboard, uh, you know, my motor, you know, I get a lot of uh, mission mantras and acronyms, as you know, to, you know, kind of motivate me. I wrote PMS on my whiteboard and I wrote parlay, you know, uh, parlay, make a bet on all that is been invested in you and been invested in, you know, double or nothing, take a risk. I wrote parlay. I wrote multiply, right? How do you multiply? And then there was S. It was, you know, the acronym was PMS. It was a, a, a steward, right? And uh, I think where I am now, what has happened over the last five years, did a really good job of parlaying, multiplying, not so much stewardship, right? And that is a mindset, right? And the beauty of it is I'm still alive and can still learn, can still uh, 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 grow. And some of it is like the, the, the narratives and the stories that uh, we tell ourselves, right? And one of the other books that I have in front of uh, on my desk is uh, Dr. Joy DeGuerre's um, Post Traumatic Slave uh, Syndrome, right? And mm -hmm whole notion of being more than enough, having self-worth, self-care, I think it's all aligned around uh, stewardship, right? And if I can take what I have and partner with you and partner with uh, Kamal, and, and, and let me tell this a little bit differently, and you may have heard me tell this uh, a, a story, and this is, a, uh, I think, the classic stewardship uh, a story. You may have heard me reframe the parable of the talents, right? Uh, and we all know the parable of the talents, and the master was going on a uh, far-off story, and he called uh, three of his servants uh before he went into one he gave five another he gave two and another he uh gave one each according to their ability and they all went out and um the brother with five talents uh went out to the marketplace and he uh he doubled that the brother with two talents uh he was a good steward and he actually doubled that also uh the brother with one talent he had a talent right but uh, he was afraid and he went and buried his talent and I think of what if the remix was because when the owner of the vineyard came back, the guy that buried his talent got punished. But suppose the brother with five talents went and found the brother with two talents. And they said, let's go find that servant uh, with the one talent who buried his talent help him dig up that talent, right? Because he was afraid and he dug, he buried his talent. Help him dig up that talent and to put all of our talents together and together we form three servants incorporated. And when the owner of the vineyard comes back, we are all paid, right? And the stewardship is for me, this mindset of no matter if you have five talents, or two talents, or one talent, it has value. And the thing about it, that one talent, brother, because quite some days I'm the one talent uh, uh, brother, but I have people in my life that say, Sean, you need to dig up your talent and combine it with what we're doing. And I think that's what stewardship for me is all about. And I think for the next phase and growth of uh, the movement and black male achievement, we have leveraged millions of dollars uh, and invested and seeded a field in leaders, uh, in organizations, uh, you know, over the last 12 years with other partners, 
uh, over a quarter billion dollars, right? But I think only a fraction of that has been invested in ownership, right? And I think the next phase of that is how do we build on investing uh, in ownership? How do we build in infrastructure, uh, whether it's for enterprise or it's, uh, real estate? There's uh, this brother, Julian Gordon. He'd be fantastic for uh, uh, for your show. Um, the, he teaches um, how to identify, uh, buy, and negotiate and buy multifamily homes to build wealth, right? And I just think that that's a part of it. And when we look at systemic racism, uh, there's no, we have to have a systemic approach. Uh, we need a strategy that's on a corner. We also need a strategy in City Hall. We need a strategy uh, uh, in the boardroom, and we need a st strategy on the block. And our challenge is how do we intersect, right? If I'm in the boardroom, I can't say that I made it. I got mine. Get yours. I got to see that my beautiful struggle is connected not only in this boardroom, but it's also connected in the block. And I think that the uh, unity challenge, our ability to really manifest the five steward brother or sister, finding the two talent, the five talent, finding the two talent and finding the one talent and forming three servants uh, uh, in, in, incorporated. And, uh, it's taken me, you know, that's why I'm glad that uh, and grateful that I'm still alive at 58, right? So many of our brothers and sisters uh, don't get to even uh, get a toe in elderhood, right? Uh, this is, uh, we're all familiar with and Grow Rich, right? The classic um, book by Napoleon Hill. And in that book, he says overwhelmingly, and then he's talking about industry and business that folks, that this, the, the, the leaders that he studied did not begin to accumulate their wealth, their riches in alignment with their purpose until after they were 40 years old. And mm -hmm. I look at how many of us uh, don't make it to 40. Or how many of us that by the time we get to 40, we have been beaten down, we have been oppressed, and uh, when we should be like just getting our groove, we're giving up. And the other thing I wanted to go back to uh, TK when he talked about building, and this is another uh, great potential gift for you, um, uh, Trayvon Shorters, who's the founder of Be Me Community, uh, has this whole asset framing uh, philosophy and curriculum. And, you know, he talks about uh, why do we need to lift up or focus first and primarily on the deficits in our communities? And why can't we focus on what are the aspirations and the values and the contributions of black men and boys, black women and girls in our communities and build on those uh, uh, assets, right? And I think that's um, what the Campaign for Black Male Achievement uh, is based on. Uh, when 12 years ago we launched it, uh, one of the first things I did was change the name to the uh, Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And a lot of folks could not get their heads around. And these are in progressive, liberal halls, black male and achievement in the same sentence, right? You don't really? mean marginalized? You don't mean like the campaign for marginalized men or you don't mean uh, 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 this is the strategy for disconnected dads? No, this is a campaign for uh, uh, a, a black male achievement. And so, so much, and, and this is a seed. Like I said, uh, I stand on the shoulders of uh, so many folks that have come before me and uh, in this moment, uh, and as you know, we're, we're sunsetting, right? Um, at the end of the year, and TK has been very instrumental with uh, just my mindset and my narrative, right? For a moment there, I was like, 
oh, I failed. Sean, you failed, right? And and through work and having people around you, right? Uh, I'm a builder because I got builders around me. Uh, come on, I'm passionate because I, I hang out with passionate people. And I had to do some internal work. And I said, Sean, if you can reframe your failure or your semen failure, you can reframe your future. And why are you focusing on, hold up, it was supposed to be a three-year campaign. <laughs> Here you are 12 years later, focus on all of what you have seeded and cultivated over the past 12 years. And in this moment, you are being freed up to, you've learned a lot. And so what's next? Uh, I'm in an intermission season uh, uh, between my second and third acts of my uh, leadership uh, uh, journey. Um, I have to uh, certainly in this moment, when we talk about black male achievement, the importance of, I think one of the things that through the partnership uh, with Dr. Phyllis Hubbard, who I think you've uh, engaged with, is elevating health, healing, and well-being. All right, yeah. uh, the demystifying, especially for Black men, um, the notion of being vulnerable and asking for help and saying I need help. Uh, a therapy is essential. If you are Black in America and you feel you don't need therapy, straight. That's where we need, you know, you need to start, right? And uh, how do we take care of ourselves? And uh, COVID-19, and we talk about underlying conditions and uh, uh, the health, healing, and, and well-being uh, aspect is uh, vital. And, you know, this year, I uh, before <laughs> we knew what, uh, what was uh, 2020 was going to bring us, uh, this was the year uh, I declare this is the year of 20 uh, of healing for me. And uh, be careful what you ask for. You just might uh, 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 get it. Uh, last year, I had declared the year, it was the year of restoration. And it was at some point in the year, I said to my wife, Desiree, I said, God, you know, something it wasn't going right that week or that moment, right? I was like, something was broken. And, and I said, I thought this was the, supposed to be the year of restoration. I declared it. And she looked at me and she said, it can't be the year of restoration if there ain't shit to fix. I was like, whoa. And so when I declared this the year of healing, uh, I knew that there was going to be some internal, uh, internal work uh, that I, uh, uh, I had to do. And, uh, I know that we only got about, you know, uh, four minutes or so, and, uh, I could go on, but I'm going to stop, uh, uh, there. And I'm saying in advance, you know, 2021 is the year of harvest. And let me just say this, people have been writing 2020 off and 2020 has been a horrible year in some respects, right? In a lot of respects, right? And, a lot of death. Uh, we've lost elders. Uh, the covers have been fully, uh, I don't know, almost fully pulled on on, on uh, uh, racial injustice. Um, but I do believe in the power of perspective, and 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 I still believe that it's not too late to make 2020 your make or break year. It is not too late to make history in 2020. It's not too late to break records in 2020. Terry Williams uh, was a maven uh, in the public relations field. Uh, she said that what you think is your curse could actually be your calling in disguise. And while we mm. have seen a lot of loss in 2020, we've seen a lot of death. But there's been a lot of birth, there's been a lot of rebirth, and with four months remaining, <laughs> there were, uh, we had an election coming up, but it's still not too late to make this uh, our best year ever. I think you still might be on mute. I didn't, I didn't hear those uh, finger popping. <laughs> my, my man said, I want to hear that applause. <laughs> <laughs> hey. 
Sean, man, I, I, I love so much about, about what you said, and I feel like we could have a second hour if we had scheduled it. One of the things I love about this name thing, when people were like, not marginalized men, not you know disconnected dads, beat down brothers, you said, no, black male achievement. Because when you name it, when you name it, you define it into being. You know, you you set a, a ripple effect into motion that affects what people will aim after as a reflection of how they see themselves. And I, I never thought about that before until you were saying that. You know, I just kind of took the name for granted, but the name captures your spirit, which is you're not just fighting against something, you're fighting for something. And you're not just defining our people by where we are right now and by what we're going through, by but by what we are in the process of creating. We are not defined by marginalization and suffering, but we are defined by our capacity to achieve and create. And I think that's powerful. One thing I like to close on, because I love your remix of the parable. And, you know, I, I think my ego wants to um, assume that I'm one of the, the brothers with the 10 or the five, and my job is to help out somebody with the one, but I wanna put myself in the position of the one and the, the person with the one talent, because I know I too have feared and gone and buried my talents. Um, I want you to speak to the brother with the one talent who has either already buried his talent out of fear or who is tempted to undersell himself on his capacity to make a difference. What do you have to say to that brother? I don't know where the guys with the 10 and the five are. I know that I'm just scared. What do you have to say to me? Well, one of the things I would say is um, in the power of uh, perspective and perception, I heard uh, Lakeisha Waldron, uh, Dr. Lakeisha Waldron preach a sermon on this recently, uh, work in the wilderness, right? I would say shift your perception and your perspective, right? Uh, you weren't the only three laborers in the vineyard, right? You were called, right? And so you're one of three people, right? That were given talent. So that's one. The other is that work what you have. You have value. And the parable says that each was given a talent according to their ability. And I would say comparison is a calling killer. Don't compare your one talent to the other servant's two talent or the other servant's five talent, right? You can do something with your one talent. And I would also say, ask for help. And that's an area I'm growing in, right? And we don't have time. That's the second hour with uh, read the work I've been doing this year and shifting my narrative. And you're, you're familiar with my, the book that I'm writing, that there was a nine year old experience that I had, that I had to shift and say, wow, that wasn't your Harlem badge of honor survival story. That was trauma. And that nine year old tra traumatic experience, you sh shaped how you've been showing up for almost 50 years, and I've just begun to first call it what it is, name it what it is, that was trauma. And once I named it, I was like, oh, it no longer has power uh, uh, over me, right? And so I would say to that one talent brother, and we all have the five to two and the one uh, uh, in us that, uh, you were born for uh, such a time as this and what you were called to do, uh, the haul and the harvest that God has for you, you will never be able to pull it in alone and that you will need, <laughs> going back to Kamal's, the social, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the social capital. And uh, I'll close with, I know I'm going over, um, but this speaks to uh, uh, so much that I've done, the book, TK, that you're uh, helping me to midwife out of me, right? Uh, there is uh, this Gnostic gospel of St. Thomas 
that says, if the scripture says, if you get out of you what's inside of you, it will save you. If you don't get out of you what's inside of you, it will destroy you. And so I will say to that one talent brother, get crystal clear what's inside of you and get crystal clear on how you're going to get it out of you and with whom uh, that you're going to need to ask for help. Because sometimes, you know, we, we've delivered a lot of stuff, right? We've given birth to a lot of stuff, but I firmly believe what God has really called us to give birth to and deliver, there is no way we're going to deliver or push it out all alone. We're going to, you know, I don't have time to tell the story of uh, my last born child, Caleb, who was born breech. And no matter how hard my wife, Desiree, pushed, she done pushed out three babies already in her lifetime. He was turned around. He was breech. And nine minutes after his twin brother, Cameron was born, Caleb's vital signs were dropping. They weren't ready for a C-section. And the doctor said, I have to go in and I have to pull him out. So he had to pull Caleb out feet first. No matter how hard Desiree pushed, he wasn't coming out. And so many of us, myself included, we try and push out some breach stuff inside of us by ourselves when we need to go up to a brother like or a sister uh, like come on say I got something inside of me and I need your help to pull it out man come on Sean. Now. Woo. <laughs> there are so many in this son. world no no go ahead man you, you, you got oh, your lighter <laughs> I'm going to get up and head out. I got my sermon for the day. I'm, I'm pumped. <laughs> Sean, man, there are so many people who see the, the craving for community, the, the longing to find your people, to find your tribe as a sign of weakness. But I think the principle you've established here today is that it is a source of strength. Don't underestimate it. Don't let anybody shame you out of it. Go get the help that you need. Find the others. Find the others. Man, brother, I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful for your friendship, your brotherhood. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to know you. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you have given your time to show up today and, uh, and be able to share your story and insights with the people. And I, and I hope uh, this is heard far and wide because I, I think what you have to offer to the world is really significant. Man, so thank you so much for joining us, Brother Sean. Thank you. Love you, brother. And the best is yet to come. Yeah. There's more to come. And Kamal... We're, we're in each other's networks now, right? And so we're going to build a social capital. Let's go. I love Thank it. Thank you. For those of you who are tuning in, I will be here tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time for another edition of TK's Two Cents. Until then, create a great day.